It is checking in uh, with Techie Chan time again here on a Tuesday today, Techie. Yeah, happy Tuesday or Taco Tuesday, depending on the <laughs> desires of Tuesdays, Joe. Uh, always happy to see you. And people get me a few days short of a full week for a change. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something like <laughs> a few cards short of a full day. <laughs> so that's how people generally describe me. <laughs> Uh, how are, uh, how are you doing? Not too bad overall is you can hear my voice is slightly better, but I can't promise you it's going to last the full 30, 40 minute conversation. And I do have something to zip. So, uh, it's improving, but against allergies are pretty high. I mean, people probably enjoy trying to get the green off their car this weekend. Yeah. Because we're very, very much green. Uh, yeah, we've switched into full summer mode here all of a sudden, of course, the way it goes in New England. <laughs> absolutely. And I have uh, oak and birch and grass of the three. Uh, big pollen allergies for me. So uh, I do in abundance and I do have to mow my lawn at some point. Uh, oddly enough, wearing the mask outdoors uh, was was helpful. For example, I went to an AIPI rally event on Sunday uh, for a few moments in, in the Boston Common and actually wearing my mask outdoors to try to keep as much pollen uh, for, for, you know, out of my respiratory area was, was actually pretty useful. Although it doesn't do much for your eyes. You got to wear goggles. <laughs> exactly. I can just picture you out there. <laughs> <laughs> with your full gear on cutting the grass. <laughs> um, what is speaking of AAPI uh, month? I know there is a, there's a special caucus right on Beacon Hill um, of legislators. Yeah, there is the House Asian caucus. We, we actually are the largest minority block for the moment uh, in the state house regarding people of color. And uh, it's composed of eight of us now, um, uh, four men, four women from all over the State. So people may remember you know, myself, Donald Wong, and Paul Schmid uh, were the first three Asians elected to the House uh, in 2011, getting sworn in. But you know, we were joined by my friend Keiko Oro, who uh, ran for treasurer and, and did not uh, do well there, sadly. But uh, what you know, to work for the Office of uh, Tourism now, which is a great contact point for us, um, as well as uh, Roddy Mum, the first Cambodian elected uh, in the state legislature anywhere in the country. As, and now we have Vanna Howard, first woman Cambodian elected to any state legislature in the country. And we have uh, er, uh, Erica Uberhaven, but also a Trump win, you know, first VMEs elected uh, to the House uh, woman, as well as uh, Maria Robinson, who's first Korean elected House. And Maria's actually been leaving us at some point in the near term. She's going to be working in the office as a, what's the title? It's a weird title. It's like the Director of Office of Electricity in the Department of Energy. I didn't know there was a separate electric department within the department. <laughs> yeah, I'm not aware of it either. She okay. she has to actually get past the Senate confirmation process. Oh. And Senator mentions the chair of the committee that is going to recommend her to the floor. So, you know, given obviously you see the, so much activity on, on uh, down in Washington, uh, confirmation hearings have been backed up again mm. because of the schedule. Um, so we're, and you know, obviously you go down to pecking order, right? Uh, levels of importance and appointments. So things in higher lead, they need goes first, like the Fed chair appointment was done recently. Um, for example, um, you know, the ambassador to Ukraine was done recently. <clears throat> they need to get those people in place. Um, but, you know, we fully expect that Maria will be um, confirmed at some point, hopefully before they hit the summer break. So. Yep. You know, well, we have our first queen elected um, last term, and well, sadly, she's leaving us just as quickly. Yeah, things change quickly. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> um, how are Asian businesses doing these days, Jackie? I know they were some of the first uh, to suffer during the early days of the pandemic. Have they come back? I mean, there's a, a better recovery uh, now. Again, there's some degree of hesitation of being in the overly crowded room. But, you know, I, there's definitely signs of life. We know the Asian markets have done fairly well because, again, we have to get our groceries. But they have the same manpower shortage everybody else has. Mm -hmm. uh, the combination of people being severely ill and, unfortunately, some passing away, plus, you know, changing jobs and careers from front-facing jobs, to, you know, non-front-facing jobs. And older folks uh, that were still doing uh, low-wage jobs, whether it's supplement income or something, you know, actually due to supplement the retirement, um, you know, have decided to just flat out retire. Um, so it's a lot of factors going on here, and uh, but Grubhub and other delivery services still a big, big part of the restaurant industry locally. Uh, but there is definitely signs of life, I and mean, people have 
you know, side going to bars and whatnot. The big one that's troubling is actually tourism. Uh, we were getting no Chinese tourists coming here. Uh, they pretty much shut down the country in terms of travel. Conversely, it's still very difficult for uh, anybody who wants to travel to Asia to see families and celebrate Chinese New Year or weddings or anniversaries and so forth. So, you know, there's still quarantine restrictions in many countries that makes it basically pointless to go because by the time you're out of quarantine, vacation's over. Yeah. And uh, there's no direct flights uh, easily anymore to Asia because we, the Russians closed the airspace. Interesting. Okay. So those prior, those who have to actually travel to Asia prior to the Cold War uh, should remember this one stop uh, between here and any Asian country. You, you couldn't fly nonstop because you floated around the, the, the fat potted earth, as they call it, you know, around the equator area going horizontally, not, you know, not vertically. So, you know, you go to LA, San Francisco, and then you hop to Hong Kong from there. Now, uh, you know, after the Cold War ended, now you had the ability to fly over the Arctic, which actually shaved like four hours. But the Ukraine war has created a huge impact on air cargo as well as passenger uh, going into Asia uh, through the North Pole. So your time has been extended by four plus hours. So my cousin, Sherlyn, is going to be visiting us for a very brief stay as part of her um, kid going to college. She has to fly from Hong Kong uh, to, to um, Korea in Korea to Boston is a nonstop flight from Korea to Boston. Oh. So you had an extra leg, but you're still going uh, about, uh, let's see, Hong Kong to uh, Japan for me was about six plus hours. So you're going like almost nine hours to Seoul, oh. the layover. And then, you know, you have to fly. Uh, let's see, when I did the Seoul trip many years ago, that was about 12 hours. Wow. Okay. So it was, you know, 20 well, it's, it's a full day of travel, really. Yeah. Yeah, we used to be about 16 hours has been a full day of travel. Okay. So that's, I mean, that's severely, people don't, I think, realize the impact that has. It's the Asian market is huge in, in the tourism market. Yeah, Boston is a very desirable city to visit uh, for Asian countries. Uh, when the economy is really good, you know, China overtook Britain, mm -hmm. number one uh, point of origin for tourists. And obviously, the colleges and other higher education has a lot of international students globally. And now we're moving to graduation season. It's a big part of our economy right now as we go to tourism. As a result of graduation, you come in for your kids' graduation, and you might as well stick around, you know, some more days because the travel is so long and enjoy the sights of the city. So obviously, in the Boston area in particular, uh, we're hoping that uh, graduation will bring some greater economic development in the various sections of the city. Um, I do see tours. I've been up on Beacon Hill to, to, to the visit the state house and work again. And uh, But the tours aren't the same. You don't see trolleys full of, of tourists like you used to this time of year. I mean, when right. I are mean, packed and Park Street's full of um, tour guides and, you know, uh, colonial re uh, actors doing some reenactments and, um, you know, people playing uh, music, uh, it's, it's it's still far from returning to where it was. Sure, yeah. And, you know, the, the business world, too, is never going to be the same. You're not going to see these huge business in-person conferences anymore. Well, this format we're in now is still the perfect format for people to take meetings in. Um, I've had very few in-person meeting requests. Um, and even media calls have changed. I don't get reporters come to my office. You know, it's all by Zoom or telephone. Yeah, yeah. I've done very few live TV interviews that people actually want to watch me on TV. I actually do end up putting you sometimes. And even those, you know, the preference to do them outdoors. <clears throat> so it obviously lighting's different, you know, try to find the right spot and, and the such. But that, that's been the preference so far. And and camera operators unions are not happy about that, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be pretty tough conditions. I've done uh, some beautiful looking days, but it was like 30 degrees outside. <laughs> <laughs> You don't really see the code uh, if it's a bright and lovely day. Right. Yeah. So, right. It's still uh, in transition. And now, you know, the numbers are, are back up again. Uh, the positivity rate is back up again. Um, some schools are putting mask mandates back in place. So here we are again. Yeah. I mean, the uh, very BA1.2.1 is becoming crack rapid. It's a uh, rapid variant. Is it BA2.1.2? BA uh, and there's also BA4 and 5 down in, in 
South Africa. And uh, I still believe Central Asia and Africa are the two places uh, that are going to get a lot of new variants because of the fact that vaccination, vaccination rates are so low. And uh, the more you allow the virus to uh, travel from person to person, the, the higher possibility of a new mutation. Mm-hmm. Right now, the efficacy rates of our vaccines in the U.S., you know, particularly the mRNA vaccine, has declined in new variants, but still well ahead of things like the flu vaccine. Um, and your body's still able to identify and attack the spike protein of COVID, despite the latest variant. The, co- the spike protein hasn't changed sufficiently that your body can't like seek and destroy. Uh, but that being said, I mean, if you're not subject to regular occurrence, your body's immune system will decide, hey, there's no threat here. We haven't seen this in a, in a while, so let's let, let's not worry too much about it. And the objective of the vaccine is like, no, you should be aware it's out there and stay alert. You know, Biden's alert. But I have no more person with um, the most recent variant um, getting it uh, than ever now. And uh, not surprising again, indoors, close contact, limited or no mask wearing, uh, I, I've not heard anybody catching this being an outside venue, unless you're like hugging somebody up close and personal right in their face. I mean, right. yeah. you know, it's a respiratory debris, disease. If someone's like literally breathing on your face without a, you know, without a mask on in front of you outdoors, I mean, <laughs> the odds, odds go up a lot. You so, could even catch a cold that way. Sure. Yeah. So again, I think everyone needs to assess their own risk tolerance regarding the circumstances of their own health and the family members they take care of their regular close contact with. And um, you know, again, I do encourage people to be vaccinated. Uh, boosters are available. Um, boosters are available for people over 50. Uh, with, uh, and also those with special underlying conditions, but definitely consult your doctor before doing so. And, uh, and also the test kits. Uh, the federal government announced that you get eight more test kits free. And uh, I burned through, I think like nine test kits or something in the state <laughs> Because of getting too many close contact calls, so the state house, uh, you know, has been getting weekly uh, COVID nineteen uh, infection notifications from employees. Uh, doesn't specify employees, you know, who don't know who they are, but we're, we're getting about twenty one. I suspect you know every week we're going to see somewhere between three and maybe six ish um, notifications, and so it reminds us it's a real concern. Uh, contact tracing is still a big deal at the state house. And those who visit knows that we have upgraded some of our ventilation areas, but we still have a lot of still air. And even my office, we've not operated in full staff mode on purpose because I do not need uh, all five of my staffers uh, in quarantine and or COVID simultaneously. So, you know, this is a big part of it. And, uh, uh, you know, anybody uh, who's employer employee, you know, should uh, be aware as we head indoors into warm months like July, you don't have great ventilation. Um, you know, you, 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 this, this disease has no problem in heat. Right. No, we, that was initially the thought that hopefully it would, you know, not thrive in hot weather, but that's not the case at all, unfortunately. And we're seeing a lot of transmission in schools, I think, right now, too. Well, anybody of a kid that I know has picked up COVID at some point. I mean, uh, we, we've talked a lot about over the over the uh, past year about masks in schools and people putting up partitions and um, you know, whether or not they should be masked or not, and your parents have the option to mask their kids or not. And uh, it's actually kind of underreported in mainstream news, but any parent knows it is just the place where uh, COVID and, you know, obviously other flu and colds and other things just absolutely transmit all over the place. And um, I've had a, a friends where um, not the entire family got infected, only half the family got infected. Again, vaccines do work. Uh, but you know, at an abundance of risk, you know, you you quarantine those family members, you know, and you just kind of ride it out and then uh, don't kill each other in quarantine. Right. Yeah. But it, it yeah, it disrupts the entire family. Um, you know, if the kids are, are in daycare, there's a certain period of time where they can't be there until they're you know negative again. So it's 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 disruptive for sure. Yeah. If you are able to and you test negative, you know, give it an extra day. Mm-hmm. Just to you know, be sure that you know you, it's fully out of your system and you're not giving it to anybody else, even though you're feeling perfectly fine. If you can't, I get it. Um, some folks can't afford to take the extra day off or, or whatever. But you know, I've been telling my friends, you know, test negative, give it one more day just to be sure that's you know, out of your system, and uh, you know, you can't possibly give it somebody else asymptomatically. Right. Right. 
Can we switch gears a little bit, Tacky? I wanted to um, to get your take on the uh, application of Finland and Sweden to NATO. Well, I mean, uh, against the most unifying force in Europe has been uh, Vladimir Putin, which is kind of ironic for uh, uh, Putin's objective is to divide and conquer Europe uh, through economic, basically natural resources, a.k.a. gas and oil uh, means, and uh, to uh, eliminate NATO because uh, there's no relevance. Uh, NATO was designed to offset Soviet bloc in a potential future military conflict, which could lead to World War III. It's a basic deterrence uh, beyond just nuclear weapons. Uh, Finland and Norway have a very long history of maintaining some levels of neutrality, uh, especially uh, Norway, for well over 100 years through many military conflicts. But at the same time, maintaining, maintaining actually a very good balance of trade uh, between the European, you know, the rest of the European continent and the rest of the world, while also maintaining uh, very good trade relations with Europe. Um, so that Europe, sorry, Russia, mm -hmm. and the old Soviet bloc as well. So those uh, uh, countries up there have done, you know, neutrality, uh, you know, very um, uh, deftly uh, through uh, over 100 years. Uh, but people forget Finland and Russia have a massive border, 850 plus miles. Uh, obviously, there's uh, access to water is a big deal because uh, Russia doesn't have a lot of great access to the ocean. So the Baltic states and that section is a big deal to try to get through. So a neutral country is very important for that. Um, and uh, the Finns are actually a major military force in, in the area. They have a large number of artillery. They have air defense systems. Uh, they have a 250,000 plus uh, mandatory conscription, one of the top three longest mandatory conscription for men in the country or military training. Um, so they are well prepared. And people ask why. It's because the Soviets invaded uh, the Finns, I think, in 19, was it 38 or 39? Mm -hmm. And uh, the Finns never forgot. Right. They, they lost some territory as a result of that war uh, to maintain the peace, but they, for lack of a term, really decimated uh, Russian forces. And much like Ukraine, to try to get to Finland is basically passing through a whole lot of marshes, and winters are brutal, as you can all imagine. So, you know, if you're armored, based military like the uh, Russians are, and you see that in Ukraine, it's very much armored base. You know, marshes are not your friend. Treads don't like marshes. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of similarities. But the Ukraine war really has shaken up Europe. Uh, unlike some of the other uh, invasions in Georgia and Chechnya, Chechnya uh, but this one in particular frightened some a lot, largely uh, the fact that they claim that uh, Ukraine was never a country one of Putin's justifications that always belonged to Russia. Well, places like Finland also belonged to Russia at one time. <laughs> they were subjugated to Russian uh, monarchy rule, uh, you know, centuries ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, St. Petersburg, you know, was one of the prizes from many wars between Russia and Finland. Mm. So, you know, they're thinking, if that's your logic, you better do something about it. And again, being part of NATO is, is a great deterrent because you really don't want to take on uh, basically the biggest armies on the planet that isn't China um, you know, on the European front. And from NATO standpoint, it's a great addition. Again, air defense, uh, another area that can blockade uh, on uh, coastal regarding both trade and military ships uh, and puts a new uh, border uh, defense on Russia to spread out their military. Um, those of you who don't know, those countries, you know, had a very, very high polling on people who want to maintain neutrality uh, within four weeks of the Ukraine war. It flipped really quickly on the polls to show the population's ready uh, to join NATO because of uh, security concerns. They want to maintain their way of life and uh, deterrence of, and deterrence of uh, NATO action uh, will bring them uh, security. And you have... Uh, Military security, it also helps your economic security. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also, part of the, also, part of the, also play with the EU anyway. They're part of a mm -hmm. EU special trading block. Uh, we're partners, but not partners kind of right. situation. So, you know, there's a natural gravitation towards that. And, uh, you know, will other countries join? Well, there's mil as you know, there's military requirements. You have to demonstrate you have a stable, you have a stable country. And you can maintain 2% GDP military spending, which everybody's now running to GDP, 2% GDP military spending in Europe. And um, you're able and willing to be able to cooperate 
to uh, engage you know, in case in Article 5, you know, we must defend each other's situation. You have to commit troops. So Finland and Norway meet a lot, actually all those requirements regarding mm-hmm. spending and they're very stable governments, very stable. Uh, Ukraine's one of the big problems is unstable government. Uh, if you follow Ukraine's political history over the last decade, um, you know, quite a bit of t- political turmoil. Yeah. It's a poor country. It's GDP is 148, 150 million dollars, uh, billion dollars, uh, as opposed to, you know, trillions, it's in the billions. And um, geographical location, you know, try to not to antagonize your, your bigger neighbor. Um, but again, times have changed. One action that disrupts the world economy that isn't COVID uh, and spread fear to uh, other neighboring countries have initiated a response. And Putin has threatened them with, quote unquote, you know, severe action. The sphere of actions are going to invade us. So why, why are you, you know, doing this? It's like we're going to threaten us next. We already see what you do in severe action. We we don't want to be your next victim. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's having, having the opposite effect of what he had hoped. Who I guess I think would happen. Yeah, and uh, you know, I like to say people ask me why it is. I say this is a domestic issue. Same thing of presidency in China. Same thing of President Biden here. This is all domestic politics. Uh, people keep thinking more than really it is. I mean. Russia is a raw mineral export. They export oil and other precious metals and wood and wheat, as you all discovered. Ukraine has a very similar raw metal, raw materials profile, wheat, gas, natural uh, metals. Uh, Ukraine uh, has a Slavic based language, similar, you know, based off Russia. They have a shared um, history culturally Mm -hmm. in many ways as well. I mean, they're not identical people. I'm not suggesting that, but, you know, they have some trade and cultural exchange and you know many centuries of that and i know the borders change over a millennia but i mean there's there's connections well the Finns, the russians perceive the Finns, you know as a similar situation as russians you know shared history cultural history uh sometimes military warfare history mm. trade history and uh from you know the Finns and the uh swede standpoint if the logic that putin's using you know, you're one of us. Come on in. We're going to come take you. Well, that, that doesn't settle well uh, with countries that have been uh, independently run governments. Russia has a declining population. It's one of the few top 20 economies that had literally losing human beings. I mean, they literally are not growing. It's not just a birth rate issue. And they have a brain drain problem. A lot of uh, people, both men and women, uh, have fl- left Russia for greener pastures. And uh, now with the military conflict, uh, many families, and particularly single men, have left Russia because of fear of being constricted into a war they want to participate in. And then you also have a you know a economy in great decline. I mean, it's it's not a top ten economy, uh, and it's it's not a great trading block economy. Um, it is wealthier than it was since the Cold War, but still far from where it really should be. To be honest with you, um, in the European world. So, and of course, military defense is the obvious one that everyone keeps talking about. But, you know, from Putin's standpoint, he has declining population. He has no more natural resources to sell to folks. He needs new sources of resources to sell to Europe. He obviously wants to expand his access to warm water because it's always been Russia's problem in all Russian history. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a military um, defense component. And, uh, you know, inflicting a 45 million people into a declining economy you know, that are uh, culturally and you know, racially somewhat sort of close to your races and your culture. It makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Yeah, and it's certainly having a disruption of the worldwide energy market for sure. Yeah, and giving, getting control of more uh, natural gas uh, reserves in Ukraine only strengthens Russia's position economically against Europe and China and any other country that buys Russian gas. So... Yeah, it is a perceived largely by, you know, it's an international affair issue. But you look at Russian domestically, there's a lot of problems. Mm. Ukraine solves a lot of those problems. The problem now is that Russia's destroyed so much infrastructure. I mean, you've seen the news, the bombing homes, schools. I mean, Maripol is basically flat. There's nothing mm. left to defend. Yeah, That's a city of, what, a quarter million plus people? Yeah. So, I mean, this kind of runs counter to... What he was trying to do was a peaceful coup and then leave infrastructure intact. So you may have noted that a lot of places in Ukraine still have electricity. You blow up electrical infrastructure, 
it's very expensive, very challenging to put that infrastructure back. And that would be on Russia to repair. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if somehow they win, mm -hmm. it's one thing to build new buildings. It's another thing when you're blowing up transmission lines around the country. Right. Anything on natural gas lines, they left those untouched. Uh, they can turn off water. That's not that difficult. You just got to take over the water plants. But uh, you start blowing out uh, the uh, base infrastructure for a, any world economy, <clears throat> any country. Uh, cell phone towers are left intact, right? They hit like TV stations, but the internet is still somewhat functioning in that country. So it is clear that, you know, Russia wants to conquer. And yeah, they're going to flatten some cities to try to put so much fear in the population. The population is going to demand the government surrender, which I just don't see that happening here. Yeah. Uh, but if you want uh, to, uh, you know, basically absorb 45 million people, now 40, because people have left, um, you need to have some infrastructure there. Yeah. It's going to be interesting uh, to see the end game here for sure. I don't know what the end game is. I think once we get to the month of August, it'll be really challenging because, again, wheat, wheat, wheat planting is now in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, get to August, the fall is coming fast. And, you know, they started the war in, you know, the end of a winter period, which is horrible. And uh, they're going to be moving into uh, end of summer. If they, they're, if they are still there in the summer doing this, they're going to move into uh, the fall and winter really quickly. And mm -hmm. it's brutal. Yeah. Uh, hmm. But closer to home, <laughs> thankfully, it's, it's much more peaceful. And what's coming up on Beacon Hill, Techie? Well, right now, uh, we have a couple of sessions lined this week. We're waiting for caucus to inform us what's going on. So I don't have a lot of notice what's happening. We obviously have some conference committees still out there, including the same day election, uh, the you know the election day um, uh, conference committee on mailing voting and things like that. So we're still waiting on uh, those uh, type of bills and conference committee. Uh, the speaker, obviously, is still trying to set the calendar. It's kind of a week-by-week -week situation. It's trying to plan short-term, long-term. Uh, we are going to try to make the July 31st and midnight deadline and closing session. However, we are operating under emergency rules, which does give the speaker and the Senate president option to maintain sessions to the very end and formal sessions, of course, special sessions at will. And, you know, hopefully we don't have another disaster situation where we're, you know, in session um, consistently and can maintain some type of normality, right? That's that's part of it. Um, in the meantime, you know, I've been pointing to the conference committee on so-called wind and climate change. The House passed a predominantly a wind-based um, bill you know, to continue our expansion of wind power uh, off of Block Island and also uh, look at uh, our tr distribution transmission line systems uh, on what we need to make more investment on those areas. Meanwhile, the Senate uh, passed the wind bill plus a low amount of climate change questions ranging from you know new tax credits for electric only vehicles, not hybrid, electric only, which is actually pretty interesting, um, as well as things like allowing cities and towns to uh, not use natural gas anymore and force their entire community to electric, electrify their system. Basically, you just get rid of natural gas and you must electrify your system. Um, there's all kinds of interesting consequences to that, um, as well as all the climate change uh, markers shift on reaching goals and carbon emissions. So now I'm on that conference committee with the chair, uh, Jeff Roy, who's from Franklin, the Norfolk County guy on uh, telecommunications, utilities, and energy. So I'm the second chair. It's conference committee of three members, three House, three Senate, two Democrats, one Republican on each side, and the Republicans, minority leader Brad Jones in the House. The Senate is the telecom uh, utilities energy chair, Michael Barrett from Lexington. He's the going to chair the Senate conference committee, um, along with Cindy Cream, the minority leader from Newton, and I believe Bruce Tarr, the minority leader from um, Gloucester, I think. Well, yeah, Gloucester. That's right, Gloucester. <clears throat> so we're going to be having meetings soon. Um, and also the clock is ticking. So uh, I can't tell you what's happening because we're still trying to figure it out. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> well, so I thank the speaker for pointing on this conference committee and those who are wondering why is the consumer chair on there. Uh, I have an extensive background regarding energy as well between my time working in Senator Morris's office I was around during the deregulation of electricity um, back in the day, as well as working the AG's office, consumer of uh, consumer advocate for uh, against utility companies. So I do have some familiarity regarding actual infrastructure accounting, as well as you know what I call fifty thousand 
foot policy books on energy issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. We'll look forward to news out of that committee as we go forward. But yep. in the meantime, how do we get a hold of you? Well, you can call me at 617-722-203. Sorry, 617-722-2370. is my new phone number. You can always reach me at tacky.chan, T-A-C-K-E-Y. That's C-H-A-N, M-A-H-O-S-T-U-V, T-A-C-K-E-Y, that's C-H-A-N, at M-A-H-O-S-T-U-V, and uh, Facebook, uh, State Representative Tacky Chan. We're looking to do a, a public hearing action committee uh, after Memorial Day. We do some some late file bills. We're going to try to uh, get these things scheduled. And uh, obviously, the state, uh, the tackychan.org uh, uh, website, you know, continues to be a resource for folks who are looking for phone numbers. It is not required to, to call the office. You can find links and other things to help out on human services and the such. So still plenty of ways to find me. I'm still room 42 at the state house. Um, and uh, my staff, you know, as I said earlier, I'm running on a skeleton staff uh, because of the uh, heightened uh, COVID infection rates. Very good. I am uh, off next week, Tacky, so uh, we won't be able to touch base until the week following Memorial Day. Well, I uh, wish you a happy Memorial Day, and, and I'm going to make one fast pitch, actually, for a friend of mine. She, I went to college. Uh, she's a Vietnamese American from Hawaii, and uh, her and her sister decided to start a new business this month called uh, Nourish.Skincare, uh, I'm sorry, Nourish-Skincare.com. Uh, Christina Don and her sister Han has uh, spent several years, and like a lot of entrepreneurs, are going to try to make their way and decided to kick off their business in the month of May of AIP month. So I know it's not local, but I told her I, I would uh, let people at least know that you know, there are entrepreneurs out there uh, who are trying to make it and, and see what happens. Well, I mean, with the advent of online or retailing, you don't have to be local anymore. You can be anywhere. Exactly. And this is kind of part of our changing job market as well, because people, you know, are thinking, well, why not do what we want to do when you yeah, had time during COVID? Uh, Try to think about what we're trying to do next. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I wish them a great success, and uh, I wish you a happy Memorial Day, and uh, we'll catch up in a couple of weeks. See you in a couple of weeks, Joe. Thank you. Mm-hmm.